We also have hybrid petal types. So it's not uncommon to you to get a report with both ETEC and STEC petal type, meaning we have um, equalized containing genes uh, capable of causing secretory diarrhea and also um, edema disease. Um, we also have other petal types of E. coli, um, like I mentioned, the um, XPEC ones, the extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli, that those are more asso associated with um, septicemic processes um, and affecting multiple tissues in pigs and other species as well. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me this week in our illustrious podcast studios is Dr. Rodrigo Paiva. Dr. Paiva is a graduate student at Iowa State University and a veteran of the podcast. So, Rodrigo, thank you so much for coming back on the show. If you would, just in case somebody didn't catch our first episode, why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Thank you so much for, for having me, Dr. Clayton Johnson, again. Um, it's, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, as you mentioned, I am a, um, grad stu a PhD student here at Iowa State University. Um, almost two years now, uh, I'm also been part of um, the diagnostician trainee group here at the diagnostic lab. And, uh, you know, after graduating as a DVM uh, back in Brazil in 2013, I, um, I had my second round of education, uh, a very important one, I guess, uh, practicing with the swine industry in Brazil. And, uh, and then in 2021, I came to Iowa State um, to do my master's and, and PhD. Um, my PhD has been focused on, on E. coli studies, um, more specifically, post-winning colibacillosis and um, you know we, we've been seeing um, an increase in post-winning colibacillosis uh, since 2017 um, here at the D-Lab and um, Dr. Marcelo Almeida has been working um, you know to better understand the potential factors um, associated with this increase um, and in the past two years I've been helping him you know, developing studies, animal studies, going to the field and sampling um, sows and piglets and, and trying to understand the factors that could be associated with, with this increase. Yeah, E. coli has been a challenge. Um, you know, it was uh, unusual a few years ago where we all of a sudden saw an increase in disease. Um, e. coli is one of those pathogens that's always in the pigs, right? Just like we're always infected with E. coli, the pigs are always infected with E. coli. Uh, but all of a sudden, a few years ago, the pigs started to get sick. And farms that historically had controlled E. coli very well were all of a sudden not controlling it with the same program. And so that was confusing. And E. coli can be confusing. There's there's a lot of nomenclature, Rodrigo. Um, you know, when I get my diagnostic report from Marcelo, it says F18, it says K88, it says shigatoxin, enterotoxin. There's a long list of stuff involved in the naming and genotyping of the E. coli. I think it would help, Rodrigo, if we started for our audience with you kind of describing the nomenclature. What does that terminology mean and why is it important to know those characteristics about the E. coli you're dealing with in your farm? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, you know, we use um, to classify and, and there's a common um, way to communicate E. coli out there that, uh, th that is using um, petotypes. So we have enteric petotypes of E. coli. We have extra um, uh, intestinal um, pathogenic E. coli. Um, the most common ones are usually associated with uh, enterotoxigenic E. coli which are those petotypes that they have genes um, that are capable of uh, inducing secretory diarrhea. And we also have um, the STX um, or Shiga toxin producing petotype of E. coli, which contain STX genes uh, and also STX2E uh, genes that it's more associated with edema disease. Um, we also have hybrid petotypes, so it's not uncommon to you to get a report with both ETEC and STEC petotype, meaning we have um, equalized containing genes uh, capable of causing secretory diarrhea and also um, edema disease. Um, we also have other petotypes of E. coli, um, like I mentioned, the um, XPEC ones, the extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli, that those are more asso associated with um, septicemic processes um, and affecting multiple tissues in pigs and other species as well. 
But uh, I think for, for the purpose of this discussion today, let's keep focus on the enteric ones and more frequent detected ones, uh, according to our, our data here, which are, like I said, the, the hybrid ones. So we've got um, toxins and, you know, we get the toxin report. And if it's shiga toxin, it's edema disease, or at least it can cause that, which kind of is a CNS type disease. The pigs are down and paddling, looks kind of like strep. We also can have the um, uh, the diarrhea causing ones, the secretory diarrhea causing ones. So like an enterotoxin, those sorts of things. What about the K88 and F18 part of the nomenclature, Rodrigo? What does that mean? Yeah, especially the enteric um, um equalize uh, the enteric ones, they um, request uh, or they have to have a fimbria uh, toxin or a adhesin, fimbria adhesin, um, at least one, or sometimes they, they even have, an, have more than one. Um, the F18, it's a common fim fimbria toxin. And then with F18, uh, you're used to see again in your report uh, after that, the toxin genes. Um, and the K88 is an F4, uh, more associated with pre-winning diarrhea, but you can have here and there some cases of post-winning diarrhea with F4 or uh, slash K88 as well. So we have to have one fimbra type, either F18 or F4, plus those virulence genes or toxin genes. Um, and those are going to form or we're going to call the viral type. So when we have one fimbra type and all genes combined, we can have more than one gene uh, in the same E. coli strain. We're going to commonly um, refer to those as a viral type. That's another important uh, term to probably introduce to the audience because I think we're going to mention a couple of times viral types here. Um, and it's important to be aware that whenever I'm saying about a viral type, I'm including a fimbra type and those toxin genes together. The combination of the two. Combination of the two, yeah. Well, you, you just have published a, a wonderful paper that does a review of the, the genotypes of E. coli that the diagnostic lab has been observing for the last 15 or so years. What would you learn, Rodrigo? Yeah, and this study was was um, pretty good. We, um, retrospectively, we, we assessed data from 2010 to 2023, so basically 13 years of data, all of them all isolates associated with clinical disease, meaning we had clinical history of diarrhea from the field, um, the diagnostician confirming histopathological lesions, and uh, at least one um, ancillary testing. Uh, most of all of them actually we had we had genotyping to confirm those genes. Um, and uh, what we saw basically um, the viral type, the most frequent detected one that we have right now circulating is a different one. Um, it has um, a combination of genes, is not the same one that we had um, 10 years ago, you know. So especially after 2017, we started to see uh, an increase of this F18, um, LT, STA, STB, and containing this uh, STX2E toxin. So pretty much containing toxins capable of causing, like I just said before, uh, secretory diarrhea and edema disease. Um, and when we talk just about fimbria type in that data, um, we also had a uh, change. So we had a lot of cases associated with uh, K88 or F4 in the past, and now 85% uh, of them associated with F18. So 95% of the cases, um, according to the VDL data, they are associated with F18 and F4. And within that 95%, 85% of those are F18s. Yeah, I know it's probably speculation, Rodrigo, but um, do you have any thoughts as to why we would see this changing genotype, um, you know, go across as many pigs and farms and regions and production systems and genetic pyramids, you know, across the U.S.? Any any reason why this has been such a contagious pathogen that this genotype has spread that far? Does it... Um, how, how does E. coli jump from one farm to another? Yeah. Said better yet, maybe how do the toxins and the and the uh, the the fimbria, how did they jump from one farm to another? Yeah, we have more evidence-based data from the um, virulence factors standpoint and more speculations from the standpoint of um, dissemination, you know, which in our mind is associated with, you know, big movement and people movement in between farms. Uh, but from the isolated standpoint, um, you know, this isolate 
um, this more frequent one, like I said, it was not present before 2017. So we started to dig deeper on that. And we also did some whole genome sequencing um, analysis. Um, you know, this viral type contained many other genes that the other uh, F18s did not have before. So we uh, put in that data in a phylogenetic tree. We saw that uh, we have evidence that it came from like uh, evolving or from mutations points uh, from other F18s. So, you know, in our mind, uh, we are putting too much pressure out there to, to uh, uh, many different pathogens. And E. coli is not different. So the pathogen wants to survive. And, uh, you know, a lot of antimi antimicrobial usage and uh, larger farms, um, big population of animals out there together, all that pressure is favoring E. coli to mutate, to gain uh, new virulence genes, um, to survive pretty much uh, in a simplistic way uh, explaining that. So we did, we did see some mutations from there. Uh, so we do have a more um, virulent strain circulating uh, lately for sure. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. And these virulence genes for E. coli specifically, they often live on a plasmid part of the, the genome. It's not necessarily in the main genome of the bacteria. It's a plasmid genome. And you mentioned the antibiotic use, right? And as I understand it, the antibiotic resistance genes, they also live in those same plasmids. So, and the plasmids, I think, can even be transferred from one E. coli to another. You know, if you're an E. coli with a plasmid and I'm an E. coli, but I don't have it, you can give me the plasmid. We don't necessarily need to, um, you know, uh, to uh, produce a new offspring. I can just steal your plasmid from you. If I get a plasmid that protects me from an antibiotic, sometimes I also pick up with that plasmid the F18, the K88, the, the toxin genes. Is all that correct? Uh, correct. I, uh, we do have those um, horizontal or vertical tr uh, transmission of genes. So like you just said, the antimicrobial um, resistant genes, uh, a lot of those are present on plasmids and um, they are um, shared in between uh, E. coli uh, and all that pressure from the from the host are contributing to that um, gene transmission um, to happen. So um, you are on 100% correct on that sense of gene transmission, uh, either vertically or horizontal. They can transmit from chromosome to plasmid or vice versa. So. That's another good point. Well, I think you've made a ton of good points in this conversation, Rodrigo. Uh, many of us were confused in the field when we saw this kind of evolution of the disease severity of E. coli a few years ago. And it seems pretty obvious that the, the changing genotype, which maybe we've had something to do with based on how we've managed E. coli, right? Perhaps selected a little bit for this with uh, antibiotics. Um, it's, it's something that we need to keep an eye on going forward. And it, it somewhat shines a light in that black box. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that perspective with us, Rodrigo. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, thanks to our audience for being a part of it. Um, you know, Rodrigo, uh, we certainly could not do this without the audience. Uh, please take a moment, share this podcast with somebody, you know, that's dealt with E. coli, somebody that you've commiserated with about some E. coli challenges so that they can have a better understanding of what's going on with their barn. Share it with your vet team or your production team. Um, and if you would take a minute to, to like the podcast and then give us a rating and really helps to get this information out to other big producers and other technical support folks like Rodrigo and I. Uh, for Dr. Rodrigo Paiva, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to chat with you on coli bacillosis and E. coli a little bit today. We hope you have a great rest of your day.